Every kid has a bug period. It's usually between eight and 12. I never grew out of mine. Ants came early because they're everywhere. I so loved chasing butterflies and looking at anthills that this was what I was going to do the rest of my life. And uh, somehow it, it just fell in place that that's what I was able to do. When I was doing the gigantic monograph of the ant genus, Phydoli, and that's when I covered 624 species, after you've done several hundred one ant does not look like, when you've seen one ant, you have not seen them all, and you realize, <laughs> you become very good at telling an ant, one ant from another. You know, the line of the back of the head, or the length of the head, whether there's a spine here or not. You can very soon decide what that, whether that species is in your portfolio or whether it's probably a new species. So this is the way it looks, uh, the finished collection. And each species, in theory, has its own tray. Type specimens are the ones that have red labels. And those are the ones that are the absolute final reference of the, the species. There isn't any real typical specimen, but it's somewhere on average looking. Uh, and uh, then you say, uh, I render thou a holotype and you wave your wand over it. And now you've got your type specimen. I write by pen on yellow lined paper. And I have never written any other way, and I never will write any other way. Even if it's a short trip to New York, I'm writing the entire time. And, I'm, and when it comes to uh, you know, getting my writing instruments out, uh, I'm the quickest draw on the plane. I can get, I can be out and writing long before these other, others have got their <laughs> laptop powered up. <laughs> to hold the instrument, you know, sort of like a, a stone, a, a flint knife, and and actually be creating the words, you know, with a with a with an instrument, has a tactile pleasure. <laughs> Although I, I don't have the belief now, um, my childhood was steeped in it. So, you know, like most Southern writers who move north, uh, I, um, I, I want to see if I can go home. There's a common interest in saving the creation. If I tried to proselytize at the same time I was trying to uh, uh, enlist, then I would be mixing my purpose and I would lose, I believe, any credibility I have. But I did have this fear that this was not what scientists should be doing. And I thought at that time that organizations like the World Wildlife Fund uh, were probably far better, doing far better than I could than anything like that. So I'd leave it to them and then uh, the role of the scientists would be to provide information that they could use. But I discovered they needed a lot more information, and they needed the direct involvement of scientists. So by our early 80s, I was on the board. Was, I went on the board of the World Wildlife Fund. I cannot memorize anything. Not one line of poetry without enormous effort. I once took hours while I was trying to fall asleep to memorize the national anthem. I still mess it up. I was I lived in fear of uh, of being called on it when when I was in high school of being in a play because I knew that I couldn't do anything better than holding a spear and even then I'd probably forget where to stand. I just some it's it is a it is I think it's genetic, you know the inability to memorize anything. But now I've made that confession. What it does is, uh, you might say, is to hold me down to reality. Oh, well, that would have to be, hmm, probably sociobiology. Sociobiology is a discipline, meaning that it is 
uh, the systematic study of the biological basis of all forms of social behavior in all organisms. Communication, uh, bonding, um, the um, size, uh, the structure of the society, division of labor, and everything else goes into sociobiology, especially with reference to its biological foundation. The subject became very controversial. It became, in the public eye, a belief that human beings are genetically determined. That's not what it is. It says that, in fact, uh, as far as humans are concerned, there is such a thing as human nature. In the 1970s, it was the uh, general belief of the social scientist that the mind is a blank slate, a remarkable uh, circumstance of intellectual history. Uh, anthropologists, most. Sociologists, probably all. Uh, political scientists, probably most to all. Believed uh, that the blank uh, that the brain was a blank slate, and it's stunning that uh, this was uh, a dogma. And one of the reasons it became a dogma was that uh, it was thought that anything else would lead to racism. When it finally was decided that human nature had, does have a genetic basis, and there is such a thing as human nature, the sky didn't fall after all. I was certain I was right. I mean, I had the evidence. Just as we uh, say of the, to the creationist, we have the fossils, we win. I had the, uh, I had the evidence. Uh, the evidence was very strong. Uh, the ideological origins of the very vehement attacks were obvious. And any discomfort I felt, sure, it was discomfort. I was mostly a little afraid of my reputation. Uh, but any discomfort I felt shrinks to nothing in my mind when I think of how it was for scientists in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. I got maybe a few unfavorable reviews in the New York Review of Books. They got killed. Well, there is the constant deep satisfaction of knowing that what you've learned and what others like you have learned, if it fits together, is a part of, uh, the, uh, of the world in which you live, now understood and to some degree manageable. We no longer, uh, we live a little bit less in uh, using Carl Sagan's phrase, a demon haunted world. A little bit more light is shed, you know, and there's fewer demons. <laughs>